This is the newsroom for today, Thursday, November 19, 2020. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN, and Tarsi TV in particular. In the headlines, the family of the 15-year-old boy who was accidentally shot in the head by his best friend claims he was left in a pool of blood for hours before he was taken to the Georgetown Public Hospital. The time that he came into the hospital, they could have saved him, but it's too late. A member of the ruling family of the United Arab Emirates and founder of the diversified conglomerate, Amiri Group, Sheikh Ahmad bin Dalmuk Juma Al Maktoum and the delegation are in Guyana on a three-day state visit. A career public servant of 25 years, Chelsea is disappointed that her appointment as the permanent secretary was revoked by the PPP government. From the emergency room to her home clinic, we tell you of a doctor's passion for healthy communities and in sport, we hear from Guyanese sportsmen and administrators on the occasion of International Men's Day 2020. With the news, I'm Avanar Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that the family of 15-year-old Rocky Saw is left with more questions than answers about his death following reports that even though he was accidentally shot in the head early on Tuesday evening, he was only taken to the Georgetown Public Hospital hours later at 2 hours 42 the following day. The teen's family was thrown into further despair when a doctor told them that he could have, been, he could have survived if he was taken to the hospital sooner. The 16-year-old suspect remains in custody as police await legal advice from the Director of Public Prosecutions. Isnal Patwa reports. Amrita Pandey never imagined that it would be the last time she would have seen or heard from her youngest of three sons when he left their David Street Kitty George Dung house Tuesday evening for a sleepover with his childhood friend. The young man, 15-year-old Rocky Saw, who was a student of Commons Lodge a Secondary School on the east coast of Demerara, was accidentally shot in the right side of his head while at the friend's Sandy Bab Street Kitty house. It is alleged that the friend broke into his father's wardrobe and retrieved his father's licensed .32 Taurus pistol, pointed it at Saw's head and accidentally pulled the trigger. The Guyana police force pegged the time of the incident at around 1800 hours, but Saw's mother told the newsroom on Thursday that her son left her house on his bicycle after 800 hours on the evening in question. Pandey explained that she heard about the shooting Wednesday morning and rushed to the hospital where doctors told her that her son could have lived if he was taken earlier. According to her, the doctor said when her son arrived at the hospital, he was already brain dead. Saw died at about 1700 hours on Wednesday. When I go, they have him a tube and everything and stuff, and then the doctor come and talk with me and tell me that he gets shot in his right side head and he, um, the bullet is still in there. The time that he came into the hospital, they could have saved him, but it's too late. I can't go. Tuesday night, when he asked me for going to sleep it for what? He said, Mommy, I'm carrying over food. I said, that what I cook for what wouldn't be eaten because I know this child like my own. He said, okay, I will buy food. I said, fine, when you reach it for what, call me, message me on my WhatsApp. He did do that and said that, okay, well, he buy the food and he's home and he's there. Pandey further alleged that her son was left to die while the suspect contacted his mother, who came from Derry on the west bank of Demerara, and took him away from the scene. The newsroom understands that the suspect's parents are separated, and so he would spend time at his father's residence in Kiti. I just want a little justice. This lady didn't have a heart. She come in Kitty, pick up her child and carry it to Derry and leave my son bleeding in the house. Oh, we mother, we all mother, you son do something, I call you for rescue as a mother. Take my child now at the hospital, now it's not you own, but it's somebody else own. Pick you up and carry hospital, now she didn't do that. She left my son there, till whatever time, I don't know how the police, whoever, pick him up and then carry him to the doctor and that was it. By the time he reached there, he brains done, shut down. Meanwhile, when contacted, Regional Commander Assistant Commissioner Simon McBeam told the newsroom that the suspect's mother contacted the police and medical services. The commander said that the 16-year-old suspect remains in custody and the police are seeking legal advice from the Director of Public Prosecutions. Saw's mother said he was very pleasant and a hard-working child neighbors everybody just coming for CBK he was a child so peaceful he just go away come away like 
you know, he go to the shop, Dubai, wherever, come home, he's there quiet, he's there in the hammock. He's there with the ball downstairs, he's play with these puppies. He had a future ahead. He had a big plan of his head, and they take it from me. He, he friends them know because they used to sit down in the room and they used to talk and he's talk what he can do when he get big, when he come out to school. The suspect in a post to his Facebook page sometime Wednesday stated that the shooting was a mistake. He subsequently deleted the post. The post-mortem examination is slated for Friday morning. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patwo. We tell you now that a 60-year-old woman has been recorded as Ghana's 143rd COVID-19 death. Dead is Patricia Cummings of Golden Grove and East Bank of Damarara. The Ministry of Health revealed that she died on November 18. She was diabetic and hypertensive. Newsroom was informed that Cummings died in the COVID-19 intensive care unit of the Georgetown Public Hospital. She is the 17th person to die from the disease for the month thus far. The ministry said officials have contacted all relatives and persons to facilitate contact tracing and rapid assistance to everyone who may have been exposed to the now deceased person. We tell you now that His Highness Sheikh Ahmad Dalmuk Juma Al Maktoum of the United Arab Emirates arrived in Ghana Thursday afternoon for a three-day state visit. He is accompanied by an eight-member delegation. Sheikh Ahmad, who is one of the notable and influential members of the ruling family of Dubai, was greeted on his arrival at the Cherry Jagan International Airport by Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Hugh Todd, Minister of Tourism, Onish Waldron, and Minister within the Ministry of Public Works, Deodat Indar. His arrival was only made public earlier on Thursday when the Ghana Police Force issued a traffic advisory. No information or announcement of the state visit was released by the Office of the President or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. An advanced team from the private office of the Sheikh visited Ghana from October 26 to 31, where meetings were held with the Ministers of Public Works, Agriculture, Natural Resources and others. The Department of Public Information, DPI, had reported that the representatives discussed infrastructural development, government's financing plan and the energy sector with the Public Works Minister Wan Ejel. Sheikh Ahmed is known for his work in founding the Africa Middle East Resources Investment, that's the Ameri Group, which has emerged as a strong force on the global front. The Ameri Group is a conglomerate which is involved in development, investment and co-owns the operated power plants, energy and infrastructure projects across the globe. It has also partnered with numerous associations which are supposed to execute its business efficiency and effectively. The, minister, uh, that's the Ministry of Health will soon be naming a team of professionals to prepare storage facilities and put other systems in place for rolling out of the COVID-19 vaccine. This is according to the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, who on Thursday met with Global Vaccine Alliance to discuss the readiness of a vaccine to combat the pandemic. The minister said the local team will be drawn from both the public and private sectors and will include experts in the area of immunization. Well, by next week, we'll um, announce the members of the team. Uh, we have been working on that. We have both people um, from ministries, from the private sector, from the, um, uh, some technical experts who will be working with us. So by next week, you'll uh, hear the team from the, the task force, basically, that has been set up to look at vaccines. The COVAX meeting, we had a very uh, extensive meeting this, this morning. Uh, with 92 countries from around the world who would be benefiting from COVAX AMC. Uh, that is, these 92 countries were identified by COVAX and the idea is that Gavi would be assisting in raising funding for these countries so that the cost for the vaccine would be very minimal. And so it was a discussion this morning with those countries pertaining to um, quantum of vaccines, type of vaccines, what are the candidates that we are looking at, when can we um, expect these vaccines to become available, what stage of development they're in, and a whole host of um, uh, things. So, and also what we looked at is putting in place a governance structure, how countries who are participating in this can also get their voices heard. Uh, we have some obligations, we have some timelines, some of which we will have to complete uh, before the year is over. Uh, these include uh, 
doing preparation in terms of rollout of vaccines when they become available, uh, looking at our cold chain, making those assessments, strengthening the cold chain, training people to administer them. So there's a whole host of things that we got to do to uh, make ourselves ready so that when these vaccines are available, we can easily roll them out. The government, through the Global Vaccine Alliance, is looking to be one of the first to access a COVID-19 vaccine once it is approved. Earlier this week, U.S. company Moderna announced the vaccine, which has proven to be 95% effective and can also be stored for long periods in cold storage already available in Guyana. Prior to that, another U.S. company, Pfizer, announced similar results, adding confidence that vaccines can help end the pandemic. When the newsman returns, a career public servant of 25 years says she's disappointed that her appointment as a permanent secretary was revoked by the PPP government. And we find out how Region 5 has managed to record the lowest number of COVID-19 cases across the country. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. Having served in the public service for 25 years, former permanent secretary of the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Sherry Samantha Fide, said she's disappointed that her appointment has been revoked. But Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, Gail Teixeira, told Newsroom that she will be reassigned to another post in the public service. Mm -hmm. And I have 25 years in the public service. Mm -hmm. I start 1995, 24th of November as a clerk. And all my appointments are appointed by the Public Service Commission, approved by the Public Service Commission, which I am um, from a clerk to a portion mm -hmm. officer, then to assistant secretary, mm -hmm. then to principal assistant secretary, then to deputy permanent secretary, then to permanent secretary, and all was, appoint was approved by the Public Service Commission. Mm -hmm. The former PS was sent an accumulated leave, which comes to an end on November 24, 2020. The Constitution gives the President the power to appoint the permanent secretaries and various post holders in Guyana. The permanent secretary, former permanent secretary, Ms. Fidi, has not been terminated, first of all. She has been, her appointment as PS of the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs has been revoked. The Ministry of Indigenous Affairs no longer exists. And the President appointed a permanent secretary to the new Ministry of Amrinian Affairs. She has been sent on leave and that as a public service on the fixed establishment, the PSM is looking to see where to place her. The former PS was sent an accumulated leave, which comes to an end on November 24, 2020. With countries across the globe looking for creative ways to get out of the crisis brought on by COVID-19, Guyana and other regional countries are being advised to find fiscal space to invest in infrastructure, even if it means resorting to borrowing money to get it done. It is something that the IDB agrees with as well. Kurt Campbell reports. Regional Economic Advisor at the Inter-American Development Bank, David Rosenblatt, is advising Guyanese and other regional economies that it is not a disservice to the country should it look to borrow money to invest, particularly in infrastructural projects during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. His comments come on the heels of a new report by the IDB which urges Guyana and other Caribbean economies to invest in infrastructure as a means of securing economic growth once COVID-19 subsides. It, it, it's okay to borrow right now. Uh, you know, um, uh, lots of countries around the world are doing that. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of what everyone's doing. It's, it, it, you can't do it forever. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I think markets understand uh, um, and, and, and certainly the multilaterals are doing everything that we can to uh, deploy as much resources as possible at, at, at very favorable terms so that uh, borrowed resources are okay to use for, for high, uh, high return, high productivity, and efficiently designed infrastructure projects. Rosenblatt acknowledged that countries across the world are looking at creative ways to get out of the crisis brought on by COVID-19, and has endorsed the report, a pandemic surge, and evolving policy responses. Just as the report has done, he acknowledged that fiscal space is, is a constraint. He supported the contention that as a nascent economic recovery emerges, additional resources should be channeled to high productivity infrastructure products to further stimulate growth. This type of crisis puts a premium on the quality of, and efficiency of public spending, right? Mm -hmm. So 
uh, one place where th some space can be found is in eliminating programs that are not necessarily going to help the recovery and channel those resources to things that will help the recovery. Mm -hmm. So one can think of things like maybe uh, subsidies uh, uh, for, for fuel, uh, in which, which some countries are considering reducing uh, in, in, in the post-COVID period in order, and those resources then could be used for for more of the pro-growth infrastructure investment. The economic advisor said the IDB understands its role in these unprecedented times and continues to share information and ideas in creative ways as a means to assist in the recovery. Notwithstanding this, Rosenblatt believes that Guyana is in a privileged position, being the only country in the Caribbean and Latin America experiencing positive economic growth in 2019. He pointed to the resources constraint that other countries face and said that while it is not the case for Guyana, the real challenge is managing the boom that is currently occurring. Guyana is in a privileged position. Um, it's, uh, it's really the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean region that is experiencing positive economic growth in 2020. The only one, right? Uh, so some of these resource constraints that many, many other countries are facing are, are not the case for, for Guyana. Uh, the real challenge is, is how to manage the, the, the boom that is, that is occurring as we speak. Um, and, and in that regard, you know, sort of the big picture issue, not getting into too many nitty gritty details, is this issue of you know, converting uh, hydrocarbon wealth into uh, human capital, people, right? People's skills physical capital, infrastructure, and, and other physical capital, and even financial capital, you know, through the type of arrangements that you have already put in place with a, with a, uh, with a sovereign wealth fund, natural resource fund, uh, to save financial wealth for future generations. And that's kind of the big long-term challenge. And, and in the short run, you know, it's kind of a, a bridge to, to getting to that longer-term uh, vision. The IDB report expressed the belief that once the investment is made in infrastructure over time, this drives higher levels of private investment incomes and consumption. Kurt Campbell. Of the 10 administrative regions in Guyana, nine of them have been hit with a second wave of COVID-19 infections, while Region 5 in the Mahaika Burbis district has recorded the lowest number of cases. The administration has credited a rigorous uh, monitoring system for this success. Regional Chairman Viction Ramphal explained how strong collaborative support with various stakeholders can be credited for the region's response to the health crisis. Isnal Patwa reports. Region 5 was the last region in the country to record positive COVID-19 cases. The first case was recorded in August this year, four months after the pandemic hit Guyana. Since then, the region has managed to record 36 COVID-19 cases to date, of which there is no reported deaths. The region recorded its last positive case on November 12th. Regional Chairman Vic Chan Ramphal, during a telephone interview on Thursday, explained why the numbers are so low in the region. In Region 5, we had a number of outreach programs whereby masks were distributed, persons were, um, <coughs> were awareness were brought on the COVID-19. Um, enforcement of the guidelines, that is something that we look at seriously. We, had a, we have a, a regional task force that um, meets on a fortnightly basis whereby we plan and execute programs that are in keeping with the um, guidelines of the COVID-19. COVID-19 testing is done randomly in identified hotspots such as the Bat Settlement and Rosignol Markets. The regional chairman further explained that the Guyana Police Force, the West Burbies Chambers of Commerce and Neighborhood Democratic Councils all assist regularly with enforcing the COVID-19 guidelines. I know that the police are out there doing a wonderful job under the stewardship of the of Commander Simon and uh, on a daily basis they engage the public on it, but uh, we have been very cautious, you know, not to um, have persons prosecuted, however they must maintain. And so warnings were given to many of those uh, persons who would have breached the guidelines. Police officers in the region also visit bars and other places where persons might gather to ensure all COVID-19 rules are being adhered to. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanello Pato. Still ahead on the newsroom, we share a doctor's passion for healthy communities and more persons test positive for COVID-19 upon their arrival in Guyana. This is the newsroom. Dr. Maya Bissoon's 12-year journey as a doctor started in 2009, but by that time, she had already overcome her first hurdle of being admitted to study medicine because of a lack of finances. 
after completing the University of Ghana, where she graduated at the top of her class, a young Maya encountered another challenge when she was offered a government scholarship to Cuba but couldn't find the funds to purchase her airline ticket. Today, she works in the emergency room at the West Demerara Regional Hospital but also operates her old clinic and pharmacy in Eccles on the east bank of Demerara. Dr. Bissoon speaks with the newsroom's Kurt Campbell about her passion for serving people, but more importantly, her passion for building healthy communities. My first obligation is to the hospital. It has to be there first and then here. I would have liked to, to be further on this journey. But um, if we write our life transcript, I guess so. And it doesn't always turn out. Um, for me, one of the first things that I had to, to deal with was, was actually getting to study medicine. When I finished medical technology, I was fortunate to graduate at the top of my class. I applied to the university I got in, but then I couldn't go because I could not afford it. I had to work and study if I was going to study in Guyana. And so I, I actually had to give up that offer. That was tough. I, I started work in the following year. I got through the scholarship from the government, but it was a partial scholarship. I could not raise enough money for my passage. And I had to give it up again. And the next year, they had the scholarship again, and I didn't want to apply. But somebody actually brought the application to me. They so fill it out. And I, had to, I remember I had to go to a meeting in Trinidad. So I wasn't here the time when the application would be handed in. So I gave it to my supervisor at work and she said, you know, we're going to fill it up. And she got because I had to get signature from the CEO and whatever. So she went through and got everything and she sent it in for me. Mm -hmm. And so then I got you. I went. Um, coming back now when you're going to set up. A business, especially when you go it alone, it's, it's expensive, it's challenging. Um, you have the times when, 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 you, when you second guess and you wonder, I mean, is it gonna work? So I started out in the medical field as a medical technologist. So I did medical technology at the University of Guyana. I graduated in the year 2000. I worked at Georgetown, the Georgetown Public Hospital for two years and then I left to go and pursue medical studies in Cuba. On a scholarship? Yes, okay. a government scholarship. So I graduated from that. We, we returned in 2008. So after that, I, I have worked at Western Rural Regional Hospital. I worked in study for a couple of weeks. And then I worked in Region 1. I was at Georgetown Hospital for just a short six months. Then I went to Region 1. I worked at Marlboro Regional Hospital. I worked at Secure District Hospital in Matches Ridge. That's where I spent most of the time. Of opened officially on the 7th of March of this current year and you 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 do know that COVID became started to become an issue in Guyana in March itself and so that has certainly um, I think it has had an effect because you find that persons who are indoors they were not coming out so the clinic did not um, see the amount of patients that I would have liked um, but what I find that now that persons are coming out more um, you find that persons are coming they're recognizing that it's there 
I find that I, I have um, a lot of repeats and persons are referring persons to the, to the clinic. So I, I think I'm starting to gain ground. The aim of this clinic, my, my, my goal, my focus, is to provide family health services in a comprehensive way. One of the, the main things I want to focus on is educating patients. Currently, what we offer is chronic disease management and various simple walk-in complaints. We hope to grow it into offering more services with time. Currently, we do um, ECG, which is the hardest and other simple bedside laboratory testing but we don't do extensive laboratory testing and the aim is that we will grow into a, fa a community family practice a family clinic that offers all the necessary services so we'll have pediatrics OBGYN, dental services and general health care that will cover all your chronic diseases all your little complaints that might pop up right now my first responsibility is apart from family and everything else when it's when we're talking profession my first obligation is to the hospital and so i try to fit myself where i don't have to short change there so after that then is when i will dedicate my time to this every day so i currently work the night shift but every day it has to be there first and then here i will not schedule a patient to see me at a time that i'm supposed to be at the hospital tell you now that a total of 11 persons have tested positive for covid 19 upon their arrival at the charijagan international airport and the eugene f Corai international airport since october 12. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony in his daily COVID-19 update on Thursday said over 1,000 persons were tested upon arrival here. Persons who are not in possession of a PCR test result, which is less than 72 hours old, are required to do a second test upon arrival. Minister Anthony said the government has since informed the countries from which the passengers originated of their status. All arriving passengers are expected to isolate for a week upon arrival in Guyana. Uh, since we have started that program, we. Uh the provider of those tests, uh, I think they probably would have completed more than a thousand tests and among those persons um, who have been tested, we have found uh, 11 persons who have been positive. So we keep, um, we keep monitoring once we detect a positive person. Uh, our staff, they have an obligation to do several things. One. Uh, we have to do contact tracing for all the persons who these passengers would, would have been in contact with. Uh, on the flight coming, um, where they've been sitting, the passengers that sat around them would have to be informed, uh, both in front, the side and the back. And so um, we are able to do that as well. And thirdly, by our international obligation and agreements that we have uh, regarding international health regulations, we are obligated to tell uh, the country of origin that this passenger has tested positive. So um, we have been uh, utilizing these systems and, and informing uh, our, our counterparts in other countries about the, the cases that have been imported so far. As a fundraising initiative to help those in need through the Rotary Foundation, the Rotary Club of Georgetown intends to host the curbside curry fiesta at Palm Court on November 28, 2020. Pegged as one of its major fundraising events for the year, a total of four different meats will be curried, offering patrons mouth-watering choices. We tell you more in this report. is going to be the best curry in town for that day. I think different is going to be something that they should enjoy, well work spent. On 
the 28th of November, the Rotary Club of Georgetown will do a fundraising in the form of a curry fiesta. And uh, we're gonna have a takeaway lunch at the Palm, palm Court. And um, we will have uh, several curries. We will have the usual uh, chicken curry. We're gonna have duck curry, mutton curry, and prawns curry. In terms of the quality of the curry, we have specialized cooks for each curry. So there is no one cook to a curry. To the, all of the curry. Tickets are available at Palm Court, the venue for the curry fiesta, as well as any member of the Joshua Rotary Club. And uh, there's a flyer which is out in circulation and there are numbers on that flyer. You could contact those numbers, those people on those numbers and tickets can be available. We, we always try with the Rotary Club to give persons more than they expect, especially when it comes to these sorts of activities. We cannot do our usual fiesta where we have um, dining in, in person. So this will be a curbside takeaway. So uh, following all the COVID-19 protocols, and all the health measures. Um, we will make sure that everything is prepared in, uh, with uh, taking into consideration the, all the health and the hygienic uh, uh, protocols, and it's gonna be a takeaway. We normally do this in May of every year with what we call our food fiesta. This year, because of COVID, we were not able to do that. So this this fundraiser will be the same. We will ensure that um, you know if there's anybody who wants to pick up, we'll be allowed to do that. But if if people would like to mingle and so on, we'll have to adhere to strict COVID measures. Ensure you wear a mask. Ensure you your hand sanitized. Ensure we keep social distancing and so on. And so on. Proceeds for uh, of this fundraising activity will all go to the Rotary Foundation. This will become one of the club's signature events and it will be bigger in coming years. Due to COVID-19, it will just be a curbside pickup. Needless, this cannot be done without the support of you. One of the biggest fundraisers for Rotary in here. I encourage everybody to come out and support us as usual. I think I think everyone should support Curry Fiesta 2020. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and birth reports along with sports. Back to newsroom now for a look at what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some cricket news. The newly appointed West Indies Test Vice Captain Rustin Chase is hoping he can develop an environment of comfort for players which will hopefully correspond to them producing to their optimum on the field. Akim Green reports on the latest virtual press briefing hosted by Cricket West Indies. Speaking at Wednesday's virtual presser, Chase said the new role would not increase his level of responsibility since he deems himself always to be a level-headed cricketer, but certainly hopes he can get more gains, especially with the bat. Leadership for me is just getting the best out of each guy in the team, finding a way to motivate that guy, and also being a, a shoulder for him to lean on if he has any um, questions or any problems that he may be experiencing, especially if he's a younger guy in the team. So for me, leadership is not making everyone happy, but just trying to make everyone comfortable and bring the best out of, of the players that you have. In terms of the role, I just think it's an opportunity for me to, to um, communicate with some of the, the other guys and try to make them feel as comfortable as possible in performing to their best ability. 
and just trying to get the best out of each person. Just over a week ago, the 28-year-old who has played 35 tests was elevated to position, replacing fellow Bajan Craig Brathwaite. Since his debut in 2016 against India, the all-rounder has quickly become a pillar in the test squad, scoring five centuries and collecting three five-wicket hauls with his offspin bowling. He is opposed to the idea that the added responsibility will have a detrimental impact on his output. I don't feel any added pressure. I've always been um, one of the go-to guys in terms of seniority in the team. So right now it's just a title for me. It's not really a big difference in, in me doing anything else. One hope for Chase as he played a number two ranked test nation in two tests is for the batting group to improve, noting they need to get big first innings total to give their bowlers a chance. With Holder still in quarantine, Chase will lead West Indies in the four-day warm-up match in Queenstown against New Zealand A, which starts on Friday, but Thursday from 18 hours Eastern Caribbean time. For the newsroom, Akim Green. The Hero Caribbean Premier League saw an incredible 67% increase in television, streaming and digital viewership in 2020, reaching 523 million viewers and passing half a billion for the first time in its tournament's history. The research was independently compiled by YouGov Sport, a division of SMG Insight, one of the world's largest and most respected research firms. More in this report. The 2020 Hero CPL was the first franchise T20 tournament to take place since the lockdown and travel restrictions resulting from COVID-19, with all 33 matches played in a secure bubble at two venues in Trinidad and Tobago. Since the tournament's inception, the Hero CPL has been regarded as one of the premier events in world cricket, and this leap in viewership shows how popular the tournament has become in all corners of the globe. Key drivers include a big linear viewership increase in India of 81% to over 74.9 million, growth of 62% in the UK, as well as significant increases across the Caribbean, South Africa and in other key markets in Asia. As well as the major broadcast deals in key cricket and markets, games were also shown live on Facebook and YouTube, meaning no matter where you were in the world, you could follow the Hero CPL. The innovative Hero CPL social media channels also helped drive this year's audience growth with engaging content being produced both during and outside of the tournament with all the major social media platforms showing significant advances in audience engagement levels. The Hero CPL Chief Operations Officer Pete Russell said, and I quote, We are delighted to have seen such a massive jump in viewership for 2020 and passing that 500 million figure is a huge landmark for us as a tournament. The interest in Hero CPL has never been higher and that puts us in a fantastic position moving into 2021 and beyond. The tournament has grown in stature and reputation every year and we are certain that will continue to be the case. We are delighted with the linear television and streaming numbers as well as the fantastic growth we are seeing across our digital channels and are excited about our upcoming plans for this year to make our content even more accessible and engaging." End quote. Hero CPL 2020 was held from August 18 to September 10 with Trinbago Knight Riders playing unbeaten throughout to win a fourth. Tell you now that renowned Guyanese badminton coach and current president of the Guyana Badminton Association, Gokan Ramdani, has been appointed head coach of the Olds College Broncos badminton team in Alberta, Canada. In 2019, Ramdani was the technical coach of the Broncos, who copped one silver and five bronze medals at the Alberta College Athletics Conference Provisional Championship and placed fourth at nationals in Canada. The athletics manager of Olds College, Trina Ratcliffe, said Ramdani brings experience and passion for the game of badminton at the college, noting he's a natural fit who student athletes can learn from. Ramdani said he's happy to be elevated to the post, adding that it not only affords him the opportunity to improve on his craft, but also provides a platform to draft international players. Now, Chris Gale has pulled out of the Lankan Premier League, claim he has an injury. The big-hitting West Indian who recently played for Kings Eleven Punjab in the IPL was one of the big-name players signed by the Candy Tuskers franchise. It is a blow not just for the franchise but the global appeal of the tournament set for November 26 to December 16. Despite playing only seven games in this year's IPL, Gale made a huge impact for Kings Eleven, racking up 288 runs at an average of 41. He made three half centuries and had a strike rate of 137, blasting 23 sixes, the sixth most in the tournament. During the course of the IPL, he also became the first player to hit 1,000 sixes in T20 cricket. And also pulling out of the tournament on Thursday was the Sri Lanka's premier T20 player, Lasit Malinga, 
Malinga's withdrawal has come as a huge surprise, particularly as he was one of the Gladiators' marquee players and was expected to lead that team. Now 37, Malinga had not played a competitive match since March and said that a lack of cricket and training this year had prompted his decision to withdraw. Although the Sri Lanka coaching staff had run training sessions and training camps throughout the year and invited Malinga to at least some of them, Malinga is not understood to have engaged in any rigorous training with the national squad. And to celebrate the contributions and achievements of men and boys to the nation, society and community at large, International Men's Day is observed every year on November 19. The theme for International Men's Day 2020 is Better Health for Men and Boys. The team this year focuses on improvement and enhancement of health and well-being of the male population across the world. We reached out to some Guyanese men in sport. As we observe International Men's Day, the team for this year could not have been any more fitting, and that is good health for men and boys. We are all confronted by one of the most unprecedented challenges in our lifetime, and that is the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to encourage each Guyanese, young and old, to engage in physical and mental activities that will restore what we may have lost during these past couple of months. It is important that we all return to active life in the most responsible way. I would like to encourage every man and every boy to find ways to re-engage the beautiful game that we so love in the most responsible way. We will survive, we will get through this but it's important that we do it collectively in the most responsible way. Good luck, and I wish us all a brighter future at the end of this most difficult period that we are facing at this moment. Thank you very much. My name is Dylan Mahadio, Reebok CrossFit Games athlete and five-time guy and a fitness challenge champion. Male insecurities are prevalent amongst us all. I personally didn't want to get stereotyped into the dogma of race or color, so this motivated me to work towards my goal and I've just never looked back since then. Being in shape physically puts you in a better state mentally. It boosts your self-confidence, so I'd like to encourage you all to get active, stay active, and enjoy a healthy lifestyle. Hi, my name is Steven Jacobs, former national cricketer. I'm just here to encourage you know, all men, be it grandfathers, fathers, brothers, men in general, you know, to, to be that role model for persons, it could be your children, your nephews, your cousins, anybody, you know, people in general. Be that positive role model, be that person that, you know, someone can look up to, to try to want to be like or even surpass them. Right, just continue, like men, let's work together to make it a better place for us and also for, for the future generation. Thank you. One Sam Cox here, captain of the guy in the national team, and I'm here to tell you how important nutrition is for a footballer. I understand the benefits of a healthy, nutritious diet in order for me to have optimal performance on the training pitch, on match days, to minimise the risk of injury, to enhance recovery time, and of course to maintain a good, healthy body composition. So do yourself a favour, do some research on what the top athletes and footballers eat, see and try what works for you, and always remember to eat right, drink right, and sleep right. Take care, and God bless. Good night, my name is Wayne Dovo. I'm a national football coach and employed by the Guyana Football Federation. It is important for us to be positive role model for the players in the fraternity who looks to us to emulate the very things that we do in a positive way. I want to also advise the many coaches out there 
that is important that the conduct be spotless so that we be seen as the true role model for these youngsters. Hi, I'm Akeka, Ghana's national goalkeeper of the Golden Jaguars senior team. Keeping fit, staying healthy, and eating the right nutrition goes hand in hand. It helps improve your playing ability. Also, having a positive mindset helps you to be an exceptional player on the field. Keep active, eat right, stay healthy. Hello, my name is Noir, I'm Danny and I'm a national badminton player for Guyana and I'm, I also play for the King's University in Edmonton, Canada. Um, sports to me has played a great deal in my life. It has allowed me to travel all over the world, it allowed me to make new friends as well as open my training as well as get in a post-secondary education. In Guyana, sports can be a gateway for many athletes to get an education as well as open their training and be the best player they can be so that they can compete for Guyana. Thanks. Hi, my name is Steve Midbow and I'm the President of the Guyana Boxing Association and Vice President of the America's Boxing Confederation. I would like to join the Guyanese at home and abroad in celebrating International Men's Day. The theme for this year's day is better health for men and boys and it could not have been more opposite as it comes in the middle of a global pandemic COVID-19. International Men's Day is held to celebrate the achievements and contributions of men and boys and Guyana has a rich history of contributors in sport, in business, in academic and in other professional fields. In celebrating this day, I would like to urge all Guyanese men and boys to continue where our national pledge would have led us to love your fellow citizens and to dedicate your energies towards the happiness and prosperity of this beautiful nation.